recording this meeting for everybody. Um, thank you all for joining us on Content Tea Time virtually. Uh, we were overwhelmed by the amount of people that wanted to sign up for this uh, for this talk. And, and, and I think a lot of it has to do with the lineup of these fantastic speakers that you're going to hear coming up. And the theme, which really matters, responsible design. If you're a, a content designer, words really matter, especially when people are in uh, difficult situations or they need a little bit extra help. Um, so thank you for joining us. I'm going to hand over to Joe Schofield now who's going to share the running order. Yep. Hi everyone. Yep. Thank you so much for coming and thank you so much to our speakers for giving up your time to do this. Um, so we've got quite a tight schedule today. Um, I'm going to quickly run through the agenda. We've got four speakers giving 20 minute talk each. Um, each talk is going to be finished by with a five minute Q&A session. Hopefully. Um, so to start with, we've got Simon Bramble at, um, in the next couple of minutes talking about how to ask questions nobody wants to be asked. He'll be followed by Amy Hoop at four o'clock talking about why this content isn't for you. We're going to have a quick 10 minute break at 25 past four. Um, and if you can join us back at 25 to five with David Dylan Thomas, who's going to talk about fighting bias content strategy. Um, and our final speakers, five o'clock, are Kirsty Brown and Karen Mocken, who are going to speak about making users feel valued and supported. And we're hoping, if everything goes to plan, that we'll be in for half five. Um, so Helen's just going to run through some housekeeping. Uh, yeah, I am. I'm also going to try and stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Best laid plans. Um, yes, uh, housekeeping. You all know where the toilets are. Uh, we don't need to do that sort of thing. But if you can all have your mics off, all have your uh, cameras off, please. Any questions for our speakers, if you could put them in the chat at the side. Um, and we will do our best to um, do a bit of a Q&A at, at the end of every talk. We won't have very long, only do a couple of questions. If you like, you can hashtag, uh, if you want to write about us on Twitter, you can do hashtag content tea time. If you're enjoying the talk and you want to share some news, or if you have any comments, do put them in the meeting chat. Um, but that said, I'm going to introduce you now to Simon. Simon Gramble, if you want to start sharing your screen, I'll just introduce you. And so Simon is a lead content designer at the Department for Work and Pensions, and it's his job to create content that helps vulnerable people get the support that they're entitled to, which means he asks a lot, why do we need this and how does this meet user needs? Uh, he's been creating content in various forms for more than 15 years with stints as a journalist and a copywriter, leading him to his current role at DWP. So if you're ready, Simon, you can begin your talk. Thank you. Okay, can you can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, so, we can. All right, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so um, hi everyone. Um, I wish I could say it's nice to be there in Manchester, um, but it's it's nice being here uh, in Whitley Bay uh, on, on the other side of the country. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about um, awkward questions, uh, really hard questions that um, we at uh, DWP, Department for Work and Pensions, need to ask people. Um, before I do that, I'm gonna I'm gonna just sort of call out that uh, some of the stuff I'll be talking about is um, uh, it might be a little hard to hear for some people. Um, I'm gonna be talking about things like domestic uh, abuse um, and um, death as well towards the end of the talk. Um, so if you do feel you want to dip out, then 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 please do. Um, but yeah, back back to back to um, back to the, the, the main the main topic of the talk. Um, you know, as 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 Department for Work and Pensions, um, you know, we we pay out lots of benefits. We um, we um, offer lots of support to people, um, and that means that we need to ask an awful lot of questions. And a lot of it is really sort of standard stuff. Um, you know, we we need to ask for people's names. We need to ask for things like. Um, unique reference numbers or identification codes uh, we need to ask some fairly binary stuff um, and for the most part uh, people are really really okay with that you know people expect it um, you know if someone needs to check uh, when they're going to get their state pension you know they expect to to have to answer a few questions um, in fact you know a, a lot of people think um, that, that we already know this stuff anyway so so um, you know being, being the government uh, so they don't really have a problem um, giving that information to us again. Um, and in fact, um, a lot of the work we've done recently uh, to do with the, the coronavirus um, outbreak um, over the last few months, uh, you know, we've actually found that 
so many people are coming to gov.uk and are looking for support with with various things you know they, they've got no idea where to start you know we, we, especially in dwp we, we we frame things in terms of um you know policy areas and benefit names and a lot of that means absolutely nothing to the vast majority of people who are who are looking for it you know people don't know what help they're entitled to um and so actually a lot of those people would really rather that we ask them questions um to to get to the nub of of, of what it is they need um but uh that being said uh you know that there's still um there's still an awful lot that we do need to ask um of people um which is which is really hard for for people to have to uh think about and for them to have to see um you know for a lot of a lot of people when when they do have to come to dwp um it's because they're incredibly vulnerable you know that something awful has happened or uh, you know that some turn of events has, has transpired which means that um you know that they need uh they need support um and you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, for, for policy reasons or, or to, to, to try to make sure that people are, are eligible for certain things, that means we need to, you know, we need to find out um, exactly what someone's situation is. Um, so uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll run through um, a couple of examples of the sorts of questions that we ask. Um, I'll show you kind of uh, some snippets of, of the research uh, that we did uh, about those questions. Um, and then I'll show you um, kind of what we did to remedy um you know the 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 earlier efforts um and then i'll i'll attempt to to provide you with some sort of uh proclamation um at the end of each each theme um so that you might have a a list to to take away with you um so to start with um uh asking about domestic abuse you know that's even even seeing it there those words on, on the screen here it's it, it's you know it's 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 a uh, it, it's a it's a horrible thing to have to look at. Um, one of the services I worked on was the the child maintenance service, and um, that was about uh, that was for, for parents who had um, you know um, split up or parents who had never even been together in the first place, but they needed to ask the other parent for um, financial support for their for their children. They needed to come to some sort of uh, child maintenance arrangement, um, and. Um, uh, to do that, one of the, you know, we, well, I mean, we have to ask an awful lot of very, very invasive personal questions. Um, and uh, one of those questions is, is um, um, uh, about whether or not someone has experienced domestic abuse. Um, we knew um, from the outset when we when we started um, to, to you do a discovery on this service that that over half um, of people who are coming to the child maintenance service for for support um, has said that they had um, experienced um, and reported um, domestic abuse of some sort. Um, that initially was 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 a much lower stat. Um, it was something like a third of, of people had said that. Um, but actually, we found out that that was because um, people who were who were calling um, the the child maintenance service they weren't actually being asked. Uh, whether they had uh, been through domestic abuse, um, they were actually volunteering the information. Um, so once um, call scripts, um, etc., had been updated, uh, so that so that um, agents could then ask that question, we, we, we found that actually that 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 stat shot up to to just over half. Fifty-two uh, percent of people um, were saying that they had um, experienced some form of domestic abuse. Now, um, the reason the reason we ask this question, um, or the reason we had to ask this question, uh, was uh, bizarrely there was a there was a fee attached um, to using the service. So, if you were going to ask the child maintenance service for help um, to um, arrange child maintenance for you, um, you had to pay a twenty pound fee um, uh, for the you know to, to, to cover some of the admin costs and things like that. Um, you were exempt from paying the fee if you had experienced um, domestic abuse. And now I'll, I'll come back to this a little bit later on, um, but that was the policy intent. Um, and so to start with, we had to find some way of asking of asking this question. Um, so the, the problem, the challenge was that we needed to ask people whether they or their children had ever been through any form of domestic abuse. Um, and as I say, this is so that we could figure out whether they had to pay a 20 pound application fee um, and obviously, you know, as, as I've just said, this is a hugely emotive thing to have to ask, um, regardless of whether someone's been through it, you know, whether, whether someone's not been through it, it's, it, it's still going to be, it's still going to be a hard thing for them to see on a screen. Um, so what we did um, was we, we gathered some user needs around this, as, 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 as you'd hope. Um, 
And, you know, overwhelmingly, people needed to um, know exactly what we meant by domestic abuse. Um, they needed to know um, whether or not they had to pay a fee uh, because of it. And also, you know, understandably, they needed to know why we were asking um, if they'd experienced domestic abuse. So uh, we'd established that, that for the time being, we had to ask this question. Um, so we started by, by trying to um, ask it really, really plainly, really, really sort of directly. Um, this is a really, if you, if you th I can't show you the whole thing, but the, the, the whole service is, is, is probably about a, a, a 30 minute process for people um, to have to go through. Uh, and there are all sorts of different questions. There's all sorts of different context switching going on. Um, so in an attempt to, to try to lessen that, uh, we thought we'd go with a, a, a direct approach to start with. Um, so, as you can see, have you experienced? Have you or your children experienced um, domestic abuse? Um, and then some some hint text there that kind of um, very briefly explained um, the sort of thing we meant. Uh, so we we that was a, an early iteration. Uh, we took that out for um, research with lots and lots of different organisations, people like um, Women's Aid, uh, uh, sorry, Women, Women, Women's Aid um, Crisis, uh, lots of um, northeast uh, refuges, um, things like um, family mediation. Uh, it it meant an awful lot of. Um, uh, you know, uh, sitting outside um, support groups and meetings um, and and hoping that people felt they were able to come and speak to us afterwards um, so that we could get their opinions. Uh, we had a fantastic uh, user researcher who was able to, to foster some really close relationships with um, these sorts of organisations and charities. Um, and, you know, through a, a, as you can imagine, through a, a sort of a lengthy period of trust building, we were able to... Um, actually you know put a lot of this 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 content in front of a lot of people um and, and and get their opinions but um on the just just flipping back to that that previous screen you know on this question um you know the the, the thing that came back was well you know i associate domestic abuse with violence um you know that you know it, it, it's about being you know but physically abused um so so no that that's never happened to me so so i, I wouldn't sort of class myself as, 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 as having experienced it. Um, and it's only when, um, you know, for a lot of uh, women in particular, in particular, you know, we spoke to a lot of men as well, but, but for the overwhelmingly, it was, it was women who, who were answering um, this question or, or feeling like, like they had to answer this question. Um, and, you know, just, just recognizing it was, was, um, was a big problem. Often, often uh, you know, we, we heard of uh, people saying that it was, it was only years down the line um that they 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 suddenly realized that actually you know that that sort of lengthy pattern of behavior um it was actually you know a form of abuse um and so asking that question outright up front um often provoked just a you know a confused reaction you know regardless of of, of whether someone had actually been through anything like that um so uh you know taking some of that research into account um we uh we went back to women's aid actually and and we took their their list of definitions um and instead of instead of um uh framing it under domestic abuse we then we, we tried to break it down into um you know actual behaviors and although this probably looks quite gritty um it actually helped people to to kind of pinpoint the sort of thing that we were we were talking about um, we also, you, you'll notice there, we've got we've got a sort of a fairly large banner at the top there. Um, check whether you need to pay the application fee. That we, we we included that um, to to help people who were surprised that we were asking this question um, to to understand why we were asking the question. Um, so by by sort of framing it in this way, um, we we lessened the sort of the, the sort of the, the jolt that someone experienced when they when they happened upon this page. Um, and then for people who um, uh, had been through um, something, um, they were able to sort of uh, find something that looked, you know, vaguely like the thing that they had um, they had been through, uh, and were able to answer uh, in one way or another. Um, so I guess the the uh, the kind of the learnings um, from this was that if if you know, we found that by 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 framing the question really explicitly, 
we we help to prevent people from from going what on earth are you asking me that question for um and secondly um we needed to make it really clear what we were asking um and also which you, you didn't quite see on that screenshot but but also um we had to give them a way to to say uh you know yes no or or actually i'm just not sure and i might need to talk to you about this a bit more um so we did give people the option to um to ask for a call back uh, on this um so that's 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 how we that's how we talked about domestic abuse uh, and obviously um this is a you know a, an ongoing process this this was probably about a year ago that i i worked on this but i, I know that there's still an awful lot of work going on to um to it to it to refine that question and also other kind of safety considerations um in that service um so for example um sticking with the child maintenance service um asking for personal details um at, you know th things that might be um easy to come by in other services so things like you know phone numbers identify ad identifiers of some sort you know addresses names um this sort of stuff much much harder um to to um, persuade people to to give up um reason being um we know that um three quarters of of uh, people who have been through domestic abuse have been exposed to some sort of uh, controlling, humiliating, or monitoring behaviour um, by a form, former partner uh, using using technology. So using you know things like uh, email, um, uh, text messages, even um, all sorts of you know horribly um, horribly uh, you know, clever ways of, of manipulating people. Um, and so we had to be really mindful of of um, how we asked what might you know on the surface of it being be be sort of fairly simple questions um so um we knew that people who've been through you know uh, 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 an abusive relationship or a you know a particularly um fraught separation were, were really you know really worried about about sharing uh, any of any of their personal information because um understandably they they're, they're worried that, that that information is going to get back to the other parent you know we had we heard awful stories of of um people having moved to um, different ends of the country to escape former partners. Um, and yet, as soon as they put in a, um, a child maintenance claim or, or any other sort of uh, claim that, that needed the involvement of the other parent, you know, within weeks, a front door had been kicked in or, you know, abusive phone calls had started. Um, so people were coming to this service um, with their personal safety, you know, front of mind. Um, uh, so, you know, we needed to make sure that people knew it was safe to make an application um, and we needed to reassure people that the other parent couldn't contact them um, with the information that they give. Um, so, for example, asking for a phone number. Uh, again, we tried to keep it plain and simple. Uh, we gave a little bit of text um, explaining why we were uh, asking this question. Um, and we found that people were really you know, really pausing, really hovering over this question, and in some cases, just actually, just, just, just coming out of a, an application altogether. Um, and you know, this it wasn't just this this question; it was it was any question um, where we were asking for some form of, of personal information. Um, so we took it out to research again to the, to the same sorts of groups I, I talked about about before, uh, and we found that people were telling us that they needed to have some sort of control over how they were being communicated with because of things like hacking. Um, they they needed to know that if we were asking um, for some sort of contact information, they needed to know exactly how that communication was going to happen. Um, so we ended up with some really lengthy lengthy questions, lots of content on a page. Um, but we found that people were spending so long debating uh, whether to even enter the, the, the information in the first place that actually putting this, this information um, on a screen uh, was, was, was helping people to enter that information in the first place. Um, so this, this was um, a way of uh, getting a phone number. We, we, tried to, we tried to as well make it very clear that they didn't have to give their own phone number. Um, we tried to make it clear that uh, we're not going to share this information with the other parent. Um, and we also tried to make it clear that uh, we would be telling them or we would be showing them which, which phone number we'd use uh, to contact them with. Um, we, also, we also wanted to give people control over things like um, when we get in touch with them um uh, and even you know if we could get in touch with them um and you know things like can we can we leave a voicemail message um and, and all of these 
you know, all of these sort of lengthy questions um, were were helping people, encouraging people to to kind of make that decision to to carry on with their their application. Um, so I guess the 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 uh, the line there was was that um, you know we found that by uh, helping people to to, to trust um, in in how we were going to use their information and and how we were going to contact them, uh, and people were able to 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 give us the the information we needed to to be able to um, uh, process their application. Uh, and then finally. Um, how we how we talk about death how we how we ask about death uh, you know all sorts of questions um uh, about this um so there are a couple of services that i worked on at dwp uh, one was um a service called um tell us about a death uh, and another was uh bereavement support payment and these were these were uh, services that people needed to use um to either get financial support or to uh, tell government that um uh, someone had died and that various things needed to stop um, so as you can imagine we needed to ask all sorts of questions about um, uh, the person who died um, the person we were asking the questions of uh, they had to uh, be dealt with sensitively um, so that their situation whatever that situation is uh, is, is not made any worse uh, by our um, insensitivity or clumsiness um, so the sorts of things we were talking about, um, you know, asking about, uh, say, you know, a, a spouse um, for, for, you know, the name of a spouse, um, national insurance number details, that kind of thing. Um, I'm not, the, 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 I'm not going to show you sort of specifics here, but the, the, this is the sort of thing we were we were uh, we were grappling with. Uh, so on the left, um, uh, talking about, for example, a late husband, or talking about John Smith. You know, we found that. We found things like uh, using euphemisms like late, that was confusing for a lot of people. It was it was offensive for a small number of people. Um, we found that replaying someone's name um, uh, throughout an application was actually uh, a, a real a real uh, jolt for a lot of people, a lot of people. You know, if, if someone had lost a husband or a wife, um, for us to keep on replaying their name um, as, as they continued their application, um, people felt it was uh, you know a, a punch in the face to, to quote to quote one person um, and then on the right this is a, 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 a an old um, uh, uh, notification letter I suppose to, to let someone know that they were going to get a bereavement benefit um, and then you know this is how your bereavement benefit is made up and it looks more like a you know a, a kind of a takeaway menu than a, than a than something of any use to someone with an awful lot of um, cognitive load to have to deal with at that particular time um so you know we, we took a lot of this stuff out uh, a lot of a, a lot of um various parts of, of various services out just to uh more to get a feel for the sort of language we were using you know we went to places like manchester library and again support groups uh, we went to registrars and um, probably you know very similar places to um to to, to where joe and, and helen have been um and you know, we 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 got people saying things like, um, you know, before we start, don't say I've lost my dad. I know exactly where he is. He's dead. Or you know, we had people telling us that that actually, um, you know, they weren't upset at a death. Um, and the the reason we were uh, getting those responses is because we were taking we were taking things like uh, letters that said, you know, that they contained those kind of generic lines. You know, sorry for your loss, or you know, sorry to contact you at this difficult time. And it's that it's that thing of of, of making an assumption about the way that someone uh, might be feeling at a particular time. Um, we we found that um, you know when someone noticed. Um, the lack of, say, sympathy, uh, the lack of a sorry or, or, or whatever, um, they would comment on it uh, and they would say things like, oh, that's a bit harsh, it's, it's direct, but, but I do understand why, why, why you're saying that. You know, it, it's to the point and that is what the situation is. Um, whereas if we had gone with more kind of softer, sympathetic language and we'd included those sorts of euphemisms and condolences, um, we actually uh, we actually provoked fairly um, fairly strong reactions from people, you know, um, people telling us well exactly what you see on the screen here, um, and actually we found that it was it was kind of safer 
um, to to not assume um, and to to try to just relay the situation in in simple terms rather than assumptive terms. Um, and so the upshot of that is that we 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 managed to get a, a kind of a style guide entry together um, uh, that that is now. Uh, used across the EWP, which is great because um, a lot of our uh, letters teams um, are, are kind of separate separate entities. And so to know that they're now using um, the same approach, the same sort of direct plain speaking approach um, as, as we use in digital services um, is really reassuring. Um, and, and we've had actually quite a lot of good feedback on, on this. Um, but getting getting people to, getting various people to, to agree to it was a, a bit of a challenge, but um, you know, we're able to show an awful lot of research um, and have you know a couple of fairly, fairly large multi-day kind of workshops to to work through all this stuff. Um, and the upshot is that we've we've managed to get a, a fairly um, a fairly unified approach to um, to the way that we talk about death across DWP, um, certainly to to users. Uh, so yeah, upshot empathy over sympathy is is the safer way to go when, when you're talking about death. Um, but uh, just just to wrap up, um, one of the one of the hardest questions to ask, uh, actually, uh, is one that underpins everything else, and that is why are we actually asking these questions. And when you ask that question, that's when you start to strip away at the uh, the kind of the faulty wiring of a, of, of an organisation. You start to you start to understand. Um, it's not really about the content. It's about the it's about the policy that are driving um, those questions, uh, or the you know the legal ramifications. So to go back to the domestic abuse question, um, we actually found that the uh, the application fee I mentioned it was a fairly it was a fairly random thing, and it was arbitrarily linked to domestic abuse. Um, and we we went back to our policy people and, and and we said you know we're getting an awful lot of negative reaction here. Why why are we actually asking this? Um, and it, you know, it, it then goes back to, to kind of twenty-year-old uh, policy documents. Um, it goes back to things like um, uh, call scripts that, that, are, that are, you know, uh, that have been years in years in use. Um, and actually, we've now been able to to, to strip away at um, at the policy. And and actually, it's now the the, the twenty pound fee is actually being reviewed. Um, so hopefully, we can do away with that. And if we can do away with the fee, we can do away with that horrible domestic abuse question. Um, so. Just to just to recap, um, if you can frame questions, you might be able to avoid um, some horrible shocks. Um, if you can make harder questions easy to answer, uh, that might encourage people to, to carry on with an application or, or, or carry on using a service. Um, if you can give people some sort of control over how they answer a question or the information they give, um, you can you can reassure them um, a little bit, hopefully. Um, and if you can choose empathy over sympathy, then um, you cut down the risk of um, offending or upsetting people at a really difficult time. Uh, but underpinning all of that, only ask necessary questions, uh, if at all possible. Um, and if you can't, then, then, then do try to strip away at um, why those questions are, are there. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Um, I think I've just come in under time there. Simon, that was absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for sharing all of that learning with us. Um, I think I have two very quick observations to make for you. And one is how the, the power of the right words and how differently something can be uh, un understood and how, how you can change how people will react to the words that they read uh, just by changing a couple of words. Superb. And um, actually, you also answered, we've had a lot of questions about... Um, um, about can this user research that you're doing in this work in words, can it change policy? And you've just explained to us at the end that they're going to start to look at that 20 yeah. pound policy, which I think yeah. feels like a massive win. So thank you for the yeah. work that you do. Um, I don't think we've got time for questions, I'm afraid, here, but you did say that you would um, you could yeah. be available to for people. If you maybe want to put your Twitter name or something in the in the meeting chat, people can tweet questions to you afterwards as well. Yeah. But um, this, this really just does show you the power of, of content design and why it's so important to get things right, particularly when people are in a distressed state and, uh, and, what, and the words that you can, can write can make a difference. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for that talk. I'm going to hand over to Joe, who's going to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Helen. And that was brilliant. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, so, Amy, if you want to start sharing your screen and while you're sharing, I'll introduce you. Um, so Amy Hoop's going to talk about why this content isn't for you. Amy's a self-employed content designer and design system expert, currently working as a product owner. 
for the BT and EE design systems. Um, she spent the first half of the year managing Babylon Health's design system. Prior to that, Amy spent three years working as a content lead for Gov UK design systems at GDS. Um, and I saw a bit of this talk at the SOFA conference and it was brilliant. So I'm really excited to hear this. Thanks, Amy. My screen, okay. Screen yeah. is good. we can hear you. Oh, okay, great. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. So, um, I have a lot to cover, so I'm going to talk fairly at a fairly brisk pace. Um, if there's anything that you don't catch or you want more information on, um, then there's my Twitter handle. It's just Amy underscore Hoop. So feel free to follow up with me afterwards. Um, so as Joe said, I'm currently working as a product owner for the design system team at BT, but my background is very firmly rooted in content design. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. And specifically, I'm going to talk about something which Simon talked about a lot in his, in his talk just now, um, which is assumption and the impact that it has when we make assumptions in our content. And I'm also going to give a quick, um, a quick content warning here. Um, obviously, my talk is about content design, but I am going to use some examples and case studies to illustrate my points. And some of those examples are a bit upsetting. And I am going to talk about examples that include people who've had to deal with the death of a loved one, um, including a child. And I'm also going to talk about people who have had a miscarriage caused by an ectopic pregnancy. And I just wanted to warn you about this up front so that you're not taken by surprise. And if you want to skip those bits, um, then you can. So with that out of the way, I'm going to start by sharing three examples. And the first one I want to start with is about the gov.uk prototype kit, which maybe some of you here have used. Um, and it's a tool that my team and I looked after when I worked at the Government Digital Service. And the prototype kit is a tool that lets you create high fidelity prototypes of gov.uk services in code so that you can test them with users in as realistic a way as possible in research. And the prototype kits documentation needed a bit of attention. So we decided that we were going to make some changes to the installation guide and to one of the tutorials to help get people um, get sort of set up and started on their own without necessarily having to wait to attend one of the training sessions that we used to run periodically. And we really wanted the prototype kit to feel kind of accessible and approachable to users with varying levels of technical knowledge. So um, to challenge the perception that we knew existed, that it was just for developers or for designers who knew how to code. And so we made the, the updates to the documentation with this in mind and, you know, kind of emphasising that the kit was quick to install and it was easy to set up. And as it says here in the introduction, a simple way to make prototypes that look and feel like pages on GovUK. But when we took the revamped docs out to user research, it wasn't long before things started to go wrong. And this is why we do research, right? So we can catch these things before we take them into production. And the, the reasons that things went wrong were a whole sort of host of host of causes. So ranging from um, security restrictions on the user's laptop, meaning that they couldn't install the prototype kit, which is a very uh, thing you'll be very familiar with if you work in government. Um, to them having previously installed an older version of Node.js, which is a software that the, the kit uses that didn't work with the current version of the kit, and we hadn't accounted for this in our documentation, to just small user errors and things like typos in file names, which are fairly straightforward to fix if you know what you're doing, but can be quite difficult to identify if you're not used to reading error logs or working in code. And the really surprising thing was that even though in a lot of cases, probably most cases, the reason for the kit breaking was actually our fault or something we could have mitigated against with better instructions, most of our participants reacted by blaming themselves. And they'd say things like, oh, I'm probably being stupid, or I think I must have done something wrong, or, you know, you must be getting so frustrated with me. And in the post-task interviews, when we dug into these comments and we asked people what they thought had happened, the overarching feeling for people who had experienced problems was, well, you're saying this is easy, but I'm finding it hard. So what does that say about me? And rather than assuming that we'd got it wrong or we'd left things out, they assumed that the fault was theirs. And then the very people that we'd wanted to make the kit feel more accessible to were left questioning their ability to use it. So luckily, because 
for us this happened in a research environment we were able to talk them through what had actually gone wrong and reassure them that it wasn't their fault and adjust our documentation accordingly but once content is out there in the world you often aren't going to get that opportunity and the consequences can sometimes be much more serious which brings me on to this second story which begins here so this is Mount Trifan. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. This is a mountain in North Wales. And in 2007, a couple called Chris and Jennifer Parrott set off to, um, on an expedition to climb it. And in preparation for their trip, they bought a guidebook titled Walk in the, Mountain, Walk in the Snowdonia Mountains. And they looked at a specific chapter in the book called Trifan, The Easy Way. Now, Chris and Jennifer considered themselves to be pretty experienced hikers. And so based on this description, they considered Trifan to be comfortably within their abilities. But during their climb, a low cloud descended. And as the couple were trying to find their way off the mountain, Chris tragically slipped and died. And the coroner's inquest into Chris's death specifically criticised this guidebook. A member of the mountain rescue team described the title of the chapter as extremely misleading, explaining that actually there's no easy way up Trifan. It's just a very treacherous mountain. And although the book does look, uh, does suggest precautions that people should take before climbing Trifan, without the word easy, the couple might not have decided to try it at all. So this is obviously a very extreme example and most of the time hopefully the assumptions we make in our content are probably not going to result in death or physical harm but there is plenty more scope to inflict emotional and psychological harm and that brings me to my third and final example here. So this is a guide from the Miscarriage Association on ectopic pregnancy and to their credit they've made an obvious effort from the outset to avoid making assumptions about the kind of emotions that their readers might be experiencing. So the guide actually opens by acknowledging that everyone's different and it explains that there's no right or wrong way to feel um, when this happens. But the guide also makes a bunch of implicit suggestions. So, for example, all of the content here refers to women, which ignores the fact that this could also happen to a transgender man or a non-binary person. And then further down the page, it tells the reader that their partner may have similar feelings to them. But of course, you don't have to be in a relationship to get pregnant. So not everybody who has an ectopic pregnancy has a partner. And these examples, I'm sure, weren't intended to hurt anyone, but that probably won't be much comfort to someone who doesn't fit the assumed mould here at what is probably going to be a very lonely and upsetting time for them in the first place. And I'll just finish this example by saying that when it comes to content about parenthood and pregnancy, these kind of assumptions are not rare. Single people, gay people and trans people are left out of the narrative persistently with this kind of content and it really needs to change. So these are just a few examples um, that highlight some of the harmful consequences of making assumptions. But I do want to stress that assumptions are not all bad. Assumptions are actually a very important part of our decision making toolkit as humans. So our brains are built to spot patterns and to make decisions based on past experiences. Right. So if I was to touch a pan of boiling water and burn myself, then the next time I see a pan of boiling water, I'm going to assume that it's going to burn me and I'm not going to touch it again. And our brains are making assumptions and shortcuts like this all day long, often without us even thinking about it as a way of protecting us and helping us to make decisions based on past evidence. But assumptions are also dangerous mechanisms of bias because our assumptions are informed by our past experiences and the experiences that are already very well represented around us. The experiences are not universal. So when we use them to make assumptions about our audience and we use those assumptions as the basis for the content that we write or the products we design or the services we offer, that's when we start to introduce bias and that's where we start to alienate people. So even though we know assumptions can be harmful, we're literally hardwired to make them and they're not going anywhere. So we need an approach for dealing with them. And broadly speaking, 
I think that there's three things we can do to reduce the harm caused by assumptions in our content. So the first thing is that we can get much better at identifying our assumptions and bringing them to the surface. So we can learn to spot when we're making them in our content and start to catch them before they get into our writing. If we know we're making assumptions, then we can start to challenge them and ask ourselves if they're based on evidence or opinion and considering who we might not be accounting for. And finally, we can work to prioritise people who are most at risk of harm from incorrect assumptions. So now I'm going to share some strategies to help us do this. So the first one is to look for assumptions in your choice of words and clues that you might be making them. So, for example, are we using words like easy, quick or obviously to describe a process or a product or a service? Because if we are, we're probably making assumptions about how a user is going to experience it. And there's every chance that their experience isn't going to match our assumption. So instead, we can be specific. And instead of saying, for example, quick, we could say this takes about 15 minutes to complete. We can also look out for suggestive language like you're probably feeling this or you might be thinking this where we're you know making assumptions about our users emotional state and their thought patterns so instead saying if you are feeling like this is a very small change that lets us give advice on what you should do about it if you are without being suggestive so we also need to get comfortable recognising our own default biases and assumptions that, that represent kind of our, our first thoughts. So, for example, if you work on the, the sort of digital part of a service and I ask you to picture someone using it, you might see a very well drawn man um, <laughs> accessing it on a laptop or you know or a desktop computer or maybe you saw him using uh, an app on a smartphone so maybe it's an iphone or maybe you've designed your content mobile first to, to sort of think about this and maybe you think that those large image sizes that you're using in your content aren't going to be a problem because your users probably got a decent wi-fi or 4g connection but did your first thought extend to someone who doesn't have internet access and so has to use a phone to be able to, to use your service? So maybe it didn't, or you know, maybe you've got very good at considering these use cases and it did. And if you did, then great, but what other assumptions are you making? So as someone who works on a lot of technical content, if I ask you to picture a front end developer, what sort of person do you visualize? Was it someone like this? A white man, maybe someone in his 20s or his early 30s, maybe using a laptop, perhaps a Mac. In my head, he's probably also got glasses on. I think most of the developers I've worked with um, do. <laughs> Did that image, though, that first popped into your head include a black developer? What about a woman? What about someone older? So we're all biased towards the way that we see and experience the world around us. And I know that David's going to talk about this later on. And identifying our own biases can be pretty uncomfortable, but we have to do it so that we can start to challenge the assumptions that we're making and start to tackle incorrect assumptions in our content. So another exercise that's useful is one that I have uh, coined an assumption safari. So the idea is to spend a few minutes going through a piece of content and actively trying to spot assumptions or instances where the content is clearly written for a person or a set of circumstances which don't universally apply. So you can do this on your own content or you can practice on someone else's and you can do it by yourself, but it's also a good activity to do with your team and have a discussion afterwards about what you found. So I'm going to walk through an example now to show you what I mean. So this is a guide from the consumer charity Witch on how to buy a house. And now I'm not picking on which specifically. I actually chose this because I used to work for them and I'm fairly sure I actually worked on this guidance. So let's start with the image here. Now, this gives us a pretty good idea of who the author had in their head when they created this guide. This is a young, straight, white couple who look very pleased with themselves and their life choices. And they look like the kind of people that are, you know, going to be very happy to be moving house. So let's dig into the content here. So it says you'll need to think about what type of mortgage you want to apply for and how long you want to spend paying your mortgage off known as the mortgage term. And in brackets, it says 25 years is the norm. 
But 25 years is only the norm for younger buyers. A mortgage lender might not give me a 25 year mortgage term if I'm older or if I've got a life limiting health condition. And this actually happened to my mum last year when she moved house and, and she was pretty surprised to find out that she had to apply for a shorter term. And then further down, the guide talks about moving day and it says next comes the much more enjoyable task of starting to furnish and decorate the property to your taste and maybe even taking a moment to simply relax because you'll have earned it. But this assumes that I'm moving in happy circumstances, whereas I might be moving into a new house after separating from my partner and I might be really not wanting to move. And it's also assuming that I can afford to furnish the property to my taste, whereas maybe I'm relying on secondhand furniture or donations from friends and family. So when doing this exercise, the idea is to list as many assumptions as you can find. And for each one, ask yourself, whose experience are they centering? And critically, ask who else is there? Who's being left out of the narrative here? But we can't just get good at spotting assumptions. We've also got to challenge them. And one of the best ways to do this is to question what we consider to be conventional wisdom and collect evidence to inform our content choices. And one example I have of this comes from a friend and colleague of mine, Adam Silver. So Adam was part of the team who designed the Children's Funeral Fund service, and he's written a blog post about their process. So the service offers uh, financial support towards the cost of a funeral of a child who's died when they're under the age of 18. And that includes babies who are stillborn after the 24th week of pregnancy. Now, the team recognised that their users were likely to be in the middle of a very difficult period. And so understandably, they didn't want to take up more of their time than was necessary or to ask them for information they didn't need. So they made a list of all the information that they absolutely required to be able to deliver the service and recorded why they needed it, what they were going to do with it, how they would check it and how they were going to keep it up to date. And this exercise is called a question protocol and it's designed to help teams to differentiate between what's absolutely necessary and what's nice to have. So doing this, the team were able to remove a number of redundant questions and cut down their forms content to its irreducible core. And one of the simplifications that they made was to the question asking for the child's name. Now, not all children who die are given a first name. So the team knew that they couldn't rely on that information to verify a claim. And based on this, they stripped out the unnecessary question and opted to only to ask for the child's family name. But research carried out by the charity Child Bereavement UK shows that many parents worry that their child will be forgotten after they die. And for this reason, the charity recommends using the child's name in as many communications as you possibly can um, to the parents. So after speaking with Child Bereavement UK, the team decided to redesign the question, adding an optional field to let claimants enter the child's first name if they wanted to. And that way they could use it in subsequent correspondence. So on paper, this approach perhaps breaks one of the fundamental rules of content design, which is to avoid asking for information that you don't need. Right? We've talked about that today. But in this case, it paid for the team to challenge their assumptions about what was right for their users and ultimately to make a kind of choice. So as we get better at surfacing and challenging our assumptions, we're going to discover more use cases than the ones that we originally thought about. And we have to consider how to respond to this in our content and what we prioritize. And hopefully we can all agree that it wouldn't be practical to try and design our content in such a way that it's 100% relevant for every single person that might access it. Because human beings are just too complex and there's too many variables. So we have to think about a more practical option. And my advice is to prioritise the people that our default assumptions don't extend to because they are the people that we're most likely to harm when we get it wrong. Or to put it another way, we should prioritise stress cases. So the term stress cases was coined by Eric Meyer and Sarah Wachter-Betcher in their book Design for Real Life, which I really recommend if you haven't read it. And the book says real life is complicated. We might experience harassment or abuse, lose a loved one, become chronically ill, get into an accident, have a financial emergency or simply be vulnerable for not fitting into society's expectations. And historically, our industry has considered these edge cases because they only affect a small number of users. But in the book, Sarah and Eric propose redefining these situations not as edge cases, but as stress cases, the moments that put our design and content choices to the test of real life. 
So instead of treating stressful situations as fringe concerns, we should move them to the centre and start with the most vulnerable users and then work our way outward. And I heard a brilliant talk about this last year from um, at NUX conference from Sarah Parmenta, who's a designer and an entrepreneur who gave a talk about designing for personalities. And in Sarah's talk, she shared an example about Bloom and Wild, who you might know, they're a UK based company who specialise in postbox flowers. And after receiving a Mother's Day marketing email from them, Sarah emailed the CEO of Bloom and Wild, proposing that they let her opt out of these emails since her mum had passed away and the emails were painful for her to receive. And surprisingly, Bloom and Wild implemented Sarah's suggested solution and they received a huge amount of praise from across the internet from people who hadn't been offered this important choice before. And the point about this example and the reason that I really like it is that for people for whom Mother's Day is a happy or uncontroversial occasion, this content doesn't detract from their experience at all. But for people whose experience of Mother's Day is harder and more complicated, this content makes a huge difference. And in my view, that is the most compelling reason to challenge our assumptions. And that's what I want to leave you with today. If we continue to challenge our default assumptions and design our content for people at their most vulnerable first, then we reduce the potential for unintended harm and we make our content kinder and safer for everyone. Thank you very much. Amy, that was amazing. Thank you so much. No problem. Yeah, I've, I've said this about one of Helen's talks, but I've never nodded so much <laughs> in all my life. Amazing stuff. Just the power that this assumptive language can have on people. Um, Marianne put a comment in that she noticed a lot of assumptions during pregnancy of partners, which kind of alienated them and seemed quite outdated. Mm -hmm. um, along the lines that they didn't have a right to an opinion and were useless. She said it was frustrating and demeaning. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, just had one question. A lot of love in the chat. One question. Um, so from Lucy, trans inclusive language is really important, but something I admit I overlook and I think a lot of us might. Are there any resources available on this topic? Yeah, I'm sure that there's loads that I can dig out. I want to make sure that I refer you to the to the right ones. So I will, if it's OK, I'll pick that up afterwards and I'll find a, a link to some helpful resources if that's OK. Great. Perfect. Um, and one question for me, because I've um, kind of blogged and spoke about similar topics. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the questions I get is, if you don't use words like quick and easy and simple, like how do you sell your service to a to an audience? Have you got any advice for that? Yeah, it's really it's really challenging. Like I was trying to think of alternatives to suggest as examples in the talk, and I think that um, it's really hard without knowing the like it's hard to kind of choose examples in the abstract because it's so dependent on context. But I think we can still convey those same things, but we can do it in a way that's more specific and meaningful to our users. So I think the example I gave was um, was one that we came up with for the prototype kit, which was this takes around 15 minutes because like 15 minutes is is quick for the thing that we're talking about but actually like that's quite a significant time for someone in the middle of their working day so trying to like be specific about what you what you mean by that means that you're aligning with your users and hopefully if they share the view that that's quick then you know that's going to be a selling point to them um so yeah like it depends I suppose is like the annoying answer but I think trying to make it specific to the context is, is always a useful thing to do brilliant love it and just I think we might have time for one more question. Okay. From Lauren, I wonder what your opinion on personas is as a user research tool. Um, even if you have conducted research, I always worry that they can get too assumptive or stereotyping. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that that's a lot about the framing of um, the personas. And actually, that's something we're looking at in my team right now. Um, and we want to kind of make really clear to our, our sort of stakeholders and the people that we're presenting the personas to that. Um, that they are like this is some stuff we know at a point in time attributed to these kind of ultimately like maybe slightly arbitrary buckets that we have decided upon and making clear that they are like make having them as a sort of living thing so something that you're going to update and revisit regularly um, and making sure that everybody knows that and that that's what they represent I think that's one of the best ways to kind of avoid assumptions and to keep them kind of relevant um, 
yeah I, I think that that's a researcher will probably give a much better answer on that but that's that's the way that we're tackling it right now in our team yeah so keep it as a living and a moving document yeah yeah definitely perfect um thank you so much for that that was brilliant no at all. um so we've now got a break it's 25 past four we've got we've put a 10 minute break in um so if you want to turn your cameras off um, we'll start up again at 25 to 5. Thanks again to Simon and Amy. See you shortly.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I um, hope you've stretched your legs and you knew where the toilets were. Uh, we're going to carry on in just a moment with our next speaker, who is David Dylan Thomas and uh, Joanne Schofield. Our, we didn't introduce ourselves at the beginning, I think. So anyway, I'm Helen Lawson, a content designer for a co-op specialising in funeral care. And here is Joe to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Helen. Yeah, belatedly, I'm uh, Joanne Schofield, content designer at Co-op um, and also freelancing at DWP at the minute. Um, so, David, if you're on the line, if you want to start sharing your screen while I introduce you. Um, so, David Dylan Thomas is um, the author of the book Design for Cognitive Bias um, from a Book Apart, which I believe is out on Tuesday. Um, he's a content strategy advocate at Think Company. Um, he's the cre creator and co-host of the Cognitive Bias podcast. He's developed digital strategies for major clients in entertainment, healthcare, publishing, finance and retail. Um, he's also done lots of presentation, pres presenting at TED New York, South by Southwest Interactive, Conflab, LavaCon, UX Copenhagen, um, design and content conferences um, and at the Wharton Web Conference on topics um, about the intersection of bias, design and social justice. Um, and he's going to talk to us today about fighting for bias with content strategy. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Awesome. All right. Uh, we'll get started. So this is Fight Bias with Content Strategy using mental shortcuts for good instead of evil. We can talk about how to use them for evil, but that's another talk. Um, my name is David Dylan Thomas. Uh, as Joe said, I'm content strategy advocate at uh, the experience design firm Think Company. Uh, and I'm also the author of Design for Cognitive Bias, which is out on Tuesday. Um, please pick it up. Um, and uh, that book began with me doing a podcast called the Cognitive Bias Podcast. And I want to tell you a little bit about how I came to be doing that podcast. I saw an amazing talk by Iris Bonnet at South by Southwest called Gender Equality by Design. And the main point she was making was that a lot of implicit bias, be it gender bias or racial bias, often comes down to pattern recognition. So an example might be I'm hiring a web developer and the pattern that I have in my head for web developer is skinny white dude. Now, if you asked me explicitly, do you think men are better developers than women? I'd say, no, that's ridiculous. But the pattern that's been built up in my mind over years of television or offices that I've worked at is that male equals developer, developer, developer equals male. And when I see a name at the top of a resume that doesn't quite fit that, uh, I start to give it the side eye. Now, when I saw something as horrible as uh, racial or gender bias, boiling down to something as simple or dare I say human as pattern recognition, I decided I need to learn everything I possibly can about cognitive bias. So I did. This is the rational wiki page for cognitive biases. There's like maybe 150 of them. And I took one look at that and realized I am not going to learn all this in a day. So I just took one a day and now I learn about it and then move on to the next one which turned me into the guy who wouldn't shut up about cognitive bias. Um, so I, uh, my friends eventually said, Dave, please just get a podcast. And that's what I did. Um, real quick, I wanna kind of just establish what is cognitive bias. And as Amy was pointing out uh, before, it's really a series of shortcuts your mind is taking just to get through the day, right? Uh, so we have to make something like a trillion decisions a day. Even right now, I'm making decisions about what to do with my hands or how fast to talk or where to look. and if I thought carefully about every single one of those decisions, I'd never get anything done. So it's actually a good thing that our minds are mostly on autopilot. Uh, but as Amy pointed out, sometimes that autopilot can get us into trouble. It can make errors. And we call those errors cognitive biases. Um, so kind of a fun one is illusion of control. So if you had a game where you had to roll a die and you needed a high number, you'd probably roll that die really hard. Um, if you needed a low number, you'd roll it really gently. Um, and we all know it doesn't make any difference, right? But we like to think we have control in situations where we don't have control and we embody that by how hard we throw the die. Now, a less non-harmful, I should just say harmful, a more harmful bias is confirmation bias, uh, which you may have heard of. It's this idea that you get a thought in your head and no matter what, um, you can't shake it. In fact, you only look at evidence that supports that idea. And if any evidence comes along that doesn't support that idea, you say fake news and you move on. Uh, an amazing example, uh, terrible example, but amazing example came along during the Iraq war where the idea was, you know, the coalition had to go in to Iraq because Saddam had weapons of mass destruction, right? 
Um, within a year, it became clear that wasn't true. And within a year, the president of the United States, who had been one of the main people saying, oh, we got to go in there, he's got weapons of mass destruction, said, yeah, we didn't find anything. Even after the president had said that, fast forward to 2015, and still over 50% of Republicans believed, yes, there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and 36% of Democrats. Um, so uh, it was a very unshakable belief once it had taken hold. We're going to come back to this bias. Now, these are very difficult to combat because you may not even realize you have them, right? There's even a bias called the bias blind spot where uh, you are positive, you don't have any biases, but you're sure everybody else does. Um, and part of the reason it's hard to notice that you have them is about 95% of cognition is happening below the threshold of conscious thought, right? So most of your decisions, you don't even realize you're making. Um, and, you know, the next time anybody asks you why you did something, the most honest answer you can give is how the hell should I know? Um, even when you do know, right, you still end up committing the bias. So there's a bias called anchoring. And the way it works is I could ask everybody uh, on this call to write down the last two numbers of your phone number. And then I could say, hey, we're all going to bid on a bottle of wine. And those of you who wrote down a lower number are going to bid lower. Those of you who wrote down a higher number are going to bid higher. It's called anchoring. It's a thing. Now, I could tell you at the outset, before we do the experiment, hey, there's this thing called anchoring. Don't do it. You'll still do it. I could say, hey, I'm going to pay you cash money not to do this thing. You will still do it. Now, the good news is that there are, in fact, content and design choices we can make that can help keep some of these biases at bay or maybe even sometimes use them for good. And that's kind of what I want to run you through uh, today. Let's go back to that skinny white dude, right? So in fact, if you have two identical resumes, and they've seen this in study after study after study, it's very depressing, uh, identical resumes, and the only difference is the name at the top of the resume. If it's a male-dominated field, the one with the male name on top will go forward in the process, and the one with the female name at the top, uh, 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 at the top of the resume will just stay on the pile. Here's the thing. Why do you need that information? As a hiring manager, what about the name is helping you decide who to hire? Uh, think of it like a signal versus noise problem. The signal in the resume are the qualifications, the experience. The noise is the gender or the race or whatever you're reading into the gender and the race uh, when you look at that name. The city of Philadelphia um, actually did a round of anonymized hiring for a web developer position, and they discovered two things pretty quickly. One is... Uh, the best way to anonymize a resume, even in the high-tech world of web development, is to physically print it out and uh, redact it with a marker, um, like a CIA document, uh, and then hand it on to the people doing, doing the hiring. Um, the other thing they realized is that as soon as they found a set of qualifications they liked, the natural next step would be to go to that person's GitHub profile. Uh, for those of you who may not know, GitHub is a code repository, and it's kind of where a web developer keeps their portfolio. Uh, of course, as soon as they went to the GitHub profile, all the personal information would be there and ruin the experiment. So clever people that they were, they created a Chrome plugin that would anonymize that data as it loaded on the screen, and then took, they did, they then, just to complete the circle, took that code and put it back on GitHub. It's there right now if you ever want to use it. Another really important element to understand uh, is cognitive fluency. And this is the idea that if something looks like it's going to be easy to read. I will assume whatever it's talking about is going to be easy to do. By the same token, if something looks like it's going to be hard to read, I will assume whatever it's talking about is hard to do. Now, I love pancakes. I've been making a lot of pancakes lately. Um, this is a recipe for pancakes, and the text is kind of small and kind of clumped together. And I glance at that. And before I read a word, I decide, you know what? I, I bet pancakes are hard to make. I don't know if I'm going to make pancakes. Now, if I see a recipe with big photography and smaller bursts of text, I might glance at that and the text itself might be precisely the same. But I might glance at that and say, you know what? I bet pancakes aren't that hard to make. I might make pancakes. Two minute video, forget it, we're making pancakes. Now, think about this in terms of public transportation, right? Um, I look at this one schedule that's supposed to get me from where I am now in Media, Pennsylvania to downtown Philadelphia. I glance at that one schedule and I say to myself, oh yeah, public transportation is impossible. I think I'm gonna drive, right? I look at this app uh, on the right and I say to myself, and again, I haven't read any of this yet. I just glance at that and I say, I bet I can handle public transportation. Maybe I'll try it out. Um, 
raise of hands, just answer in your heart. Uh, which of the following do you think is true? Rosa Parks was born in 1912. Rosa Parks was born in 1914. Um, if you're voting right now, I'll just tell you, uh, you're both wrong. Rosa Parks was born in 1913. But generally speaking, when faced with these two options, most people opt for Rosa Parks was born in 1914. Why? Because, sad as it may sound, the easier something is to read, the more likely we are to think it's true but it gets worse. If something rhymes, we actually think it's more true. And this has consequences. Now what's happening here is that um, we like things that are easy to process. One thing I've learned by looking at hundreds of biases is the consistent thing is every single one of them is supposed to give you a shortcut to certainty. We love certainty and we hate uncertainty. Um, and Things that are easier to process give us a feeling of certainty. I'll give you an example. Um, try to picture, like, if I asked you, what did you get for your fifth birthday? Um, you might have a difficult time remembering. And if I were to say, oh, you got a truck, right? A little toy truck. And you might say, I don't know about that. That doesn't really feel true. I can't remember clearly. On the other hand, if I asked you, uh, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Right? You'd be able to recall that pretty clearly. And you have a pretty good degree of certainty around that because it's easy to remember. It's easy to process. We equate easy to process with true. Things that rhyme are easier to remember. They're easier to process. Things that use plain language and use bright, clear fonts are easier to process and therefore feel more true. Now, this becomes important when you're dealing with something that people actually need to believe is true. Uh, in America, we have a crisis around African-Americans not believing health information that comes from the government. Uh, in 2002, when uh, referenced the statement, the government usually tells the truth about major health issues like HIV AIDS, only 37% of African Americans uh, agreed with that statement. By the time you get to 2016, that number has dropped to 18%. Now we could do a whole other talk about why <laughs> there are legit reasons African Americans have concerns about health information coming from the government, but the fact remains this is information that could save lives, especially now, right? So uh, if it needs to rhyme, if it needs to use plain language and clear fonts, so be it. Uh, now, my editor, when I was putting my book together, and I put this example so, and, and said, that's great, but can you actually point to examples where clearer, easier to process content, you know, saved lives or improved health outcomes? And I'm glad she challenged me on that because it forced me to do the work, do the research and find out that Yes, in fact, right? So here's an example from a study of women who were smoking during pregnancy. And when they were presented with information at the third grade reading level, right? Very easy to process. They were more likely uh, to uh, not smoke during pregnancy and even six weeks after they had their children. Um, similarly, when uh, you had people who were caregiving for folks and trying to give them medicine, uh, when you use the plain language pictogram based intervention, right? You saw a decreased dosing errors and improved adherence, people actually taking uh, their medicine um, in the group that had been uh, given that easier to process content. Now you might be thinking, oh, Dave, that's great for plain language. I get that, but rhyming, really, does that matter? So here in the States, we had a campaign called Click It or Ticket. And the idea was people weren't buckling their seatbelts and people were getting killed. So um, they first made a law that said, look, if you're not wearing your seatbelt, we can give you a ticket, right? And that in and of itself was pretty effective, um, especially among older folks, but younger folks weren't completely on board. So they introduced Click It or Ticket and the results were that national belt use among young men and women ages 16 to 24 moved from 65% to 72% and 73% to 80% respectively. And just to put that in human terms, for every percentage point increase in seatbelt use, uh, 270 lives are saved. So if you do the math, that's roughly 4,000 lives saved in part through rhyming. It's silly, but it works. Um, I wanna talk a bit about the framing effect because I, I believe it's the most dangerous bias in the world. Uh, it starts out pretty innocently. Um, let's say you go to a store and you see a sign that says beef 95% lean, right? And next to it is a sign that says beef 5% uh, fat. Um, which beef do you think is going to sell better, right? Um, it's the same thing, but I've framed it in a way that one option seems better than the other. Now, this is all good and well when I'm talking about beef, but what if I were to say, should we go to war in April or should we go to war in May? See what I did there? We're no longer talking about 
should we go to war in the first place? And wars have been started over less. Now, if you are bilingual, multilingual, you have a secret weapon against the framing effect. If you think about the decision in your non-native language, you are less likely to fall for the scam. Now, I speak uh, very little French. And so if I tried to think about the beef decision in French, I might say to myself, okay, beef, that's beef, that's a lot of vowels, 95%, um, that's 89, I believe, maybe, right? And by the time I get through all of that, the scam is obvious, right? And what's happened is I've slowed down my thinking. And that's the key. One of the foundational works on cognitive bias is called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, highly recommended. And a lot of what it deals with is this idea of most bias happens when you're thinking too fast. When you slow down your thinking, you're less likely to fall for a lot of these assumptions. Now, you can actually use the framing effect for good. So uh, there's an experiment where you show an audience a picture like this and say, should this person drive this car? And what you get is a policy discussion. Some people will say, oh, old people are bad at everything. Don't let them drive. And you'll have other people saying, that's ageist. What are you talking about? People can do what they want. All you will learn by the end of that conversation is who is on what side. I can show this exact same photo to another audience and ask, how might this person drive this car? And get a completely different discussion. It's a design discussion, right? And some people might say, well, what if we change the shape of the steering wheel? Or what if we move to the dashboard? Right. And what I'll learn by the end of that conversation is several different ways that person might be able to drive that car. All I did was change a couple of words in the question, but by changing the frame, I changed the conversation. In fact, what if I were to ask, how might we do a better job of moving people around? Right. Because the reason the guy was in the car in the first place is because he was here, but he wanted to be there. And if I frame it this way, things like public transportation are on the table. I want to close by talking about our own cognitive biases because these are the ones that can really get our users in trouble. And like I said, we're coming back to confirmation bias. Now, I want to explain how I got the scientific method completely wrong. Uh, I used to think the scientific method was um, you have an idea about how the world works, you have a hypothesis, you test it out, and if you get a good result, you have a bunch of other people try the same thing, and if they get the same result, yay, it's a law, move on to the next one. Um, after talking to some actual scientists, I found out it's not quite that simple. Uh, yeah, sure, I uh, come up with an idea for how I think the world works. I test that, and if I get a good result, all y'all try it too, and if you get the same result, great. I get to spend the rest of forever trying to prove myself wrong. I have to ask myself, if I'm wrong, what else might be true? Okay, let me now try to prove that, which is much more rigorous and was designed specifically to combat confirmation bias. And as content strategists and designers, it is very easy for us to leave good design on the table. Let me show you how easy. Let's say there's a computer game. And the way the game works is the computer is going to show you this and say, hey, put whatever number you want where that question mark is, and I will tell you if that number fits the pattern. Put in as many numbers as you like, and when you're ready, tell me what you think the pattern is. If you're like me, you start out by trying eight. And the computer says, congratulations, that fits the pattern. Would you like to try another number? And if you're like me, you say, hold my beer, I got this. Uh, the answer is the pattern is uh, even numbers. And the computer says, no. And the reason it says no is because I didn't try this. The pattern is not even numbers. The pattern is every number is higher than the number that came before it, which is a much more elegant solution and easier to code and probably cheaper. Uh, but I never got there because I was so in love with my even numbers idea. Now, there are tools out there to help us avoid that outcome. One is called uh, Red Team, Blue Team. Um, and I, I actually learned this from a guy um, who works with Tech for Good Live um, uh, and is actually out, at, out in Manchester, um, uh, where I think some of y'all are. Um, but the basic idea is that you have a blue team who... Um, uh, does like the research and the basic prototyping, like gets the idea to a place where you're ready to actually build something. But before you go that far, the red team comes in for one day and their job is to go to war with the blue team and to look for every assumption that the blue, that the, the blue team has been making or every possible harm the blue team didn't see coming because they were so in love with their initial idea. Um, I like this approach because it's fairly economical. I don't have to go to my boss and say, okay, from now on, we got to spin up two teams for every single project and they got to check each other's work every day. No, I need one team for one day to make it a little less likely that we put something harmful out into the world. Another tool I like for this is called speculative design. 
And I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with Black Mirror, but it's basically like a, a Twilight Zone for tech. You take some near future um, tech and then you tell a story about how it would be used by ordinary human beings. And the answer is almost always terrible. Um, in fact, I think anybody working on a new technology by law should have to write a Black Mirror episode about it. Um, but this is a real job, right? There's an agency called Superflux and they went to the United Arab Emirates uh, and their task was to help the UAE think about the future of energy. Uh, and they were trying to decide, should we continue with fossil fuels or should we invest in renewables? And what uh, Superflux did among other things was say, okay, let's answer the question, what would your air quality be like five years out, 10 years out, 20 years out, if you stay on the path of fossil fuels? But they didn't just answer it, they bottled it and then they made them breathe it. And about 10 years out, it becomes unbreathable and causation or correlation at the end of that engagement, the UAE announced we are going to invest 150 billion with a B dollars in uh, renewables. I'd like to close by talking about Deformation Professionnelle. Told you I speak French. Now, this is a, um, this is a, 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 um, a bias where we see the whole world through the lens of our job. And in our workaholic world, that may seem like a good idea until it's not. The paparazzi who ran Francis Die off the road probably thought they were doing a good job. And technically they were, right? They were getting really difficult to get photographs that were gonna fetch them a whole lot of money, but what they weren't doing a good job of was being human beings. Now, the police commissioner of Philadelphia, um, the former police commissioner, a couple, a couple commissioners back, when he got the job, he asked his officers, what do you think your job is? And his officers pretty regularly said um, to enforce the law. And he said, okay, that seems like a reasonable answer, but what if I were to tell you your job is to uh, protect civil rights? Now that's a bigger job, right? It, it encompasses enforce the law, but it forces you to treat people with dignity, right? It forces you to not choke black people, right? Um, and it's a harder job than they thought it was, but it's also a definition of the job that gives them a mandate to treat people with dignity, but it also gives them permission to treat people with dignity. I submit that our jobs are harder than we think, right? Our jobs are not simply to design cool shit. And we need to come up with a definition for our jobs that allows us to be more human to each other. Now, uh, people are working on this already. You've got Mike Montero out at Mule Design. He's created a little red book of design ethics, which is kind of a first do no harm Hippocratic oath for designers. Um, the Design Justice Network has amazing principles and is doing amazing work in this area. And I just wanna read off these first two. Um, we use design to sustain, heal, and empower our communities as well, to, as well as to seek liberation from exploitative and oppressive systems. Principle two, we center the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. That's just the first two principles. And I think you've got your work cut out for you just trying to create a design practice that adheres to those. Um, Erica Hall likes to put it in terms of the difference between user-centered design and shareholder-centered design. And we often think we're practicing the former when in fact what we're really practicing is the latter. Uh, another great tool for this is called the Tarot Cards of Tech. Um, and by the way, I, I can send out a resource sheet after this to everybody so you don't have to like try to scribble all this down. But the Tarot Cards of Tech is an amazing uh, website uh, where you have these interventions where you click on these cards and they flip over and uh, they give you these really provocative questions about your design. How might cultural habits change how your product is used? And how might your product change cultural habits? Imagine if Twitter had asked itself these questions before they launched. We might see a very different role today. And this is something that software engineers are taking on as well. There's the never again pledge that a lot of data, data scientists took on when uh, tech companies started wanting to use their skills for very nefarious ends. And uh, sadly, this is in a very long tradition going back to the Holocaust of people trying to use data science uh, to do terrible things. Um, and we're starting to see this play out uh, with software engineers at Google where Project Maven was a Google project that was basically a battlefield AI. And a lot of their software engineers got together and said, I did not get into this business to build weapons. Uh, so we're gonna walk if you keep us on this project. And Google backed down. They walked away from a $250 million project with the contract with the military. 
And then they turned right around and did Project Dragonfly, which was censored search in China, and this is still going on. By the way, who comes up with these James Bond villain names for their projects, right? Um, we must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. Now, this is not some software guru at a TED Talk. This is Martin Luther King. He said this and saw this 50 years ago, and it is only more true today. So the challenge I would give each of us is, how can we define our jobs in a way that allows us to be more human to each other? Thank you. David, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so much food for thought in that. I feel like in the end, I want to watch it another five times, just to, in the best possible way, just to unpack all the information you gave us. And I love the idea for the Black Mirror episode and the tarot cards for tech. Um, th there's one question from Amy in the chat. I don't know if you're able to see it, but we're slightly out of time. But if I don't know if Amy's question was, do you think learning so much about cognitive bias has helped you be less biased? So, short so <laughs> yeah, so the short answer is unfortunately no. Knowing about a bias does not prevent you from it. And that's why the best defense against bias is people with different biases. So no one is unbiased, but definitely people have different life experiences than you do. And if you could bring their biases to the table, your biases are hopefully complementary in a way that creates a less harmful product. That's the short answer. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. Sure. Fantastic. I'm, I'm going to pass over to Helen, who's going to introduce Kirsty and Karen for our final talk. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, David. That was great. Click, click every trip. Um, I'm going to introduce, oh, if you can start sharing your screens now, please, uh, Karen and Kirsty. We were hoping to have Sarah Wilcox from the NHS um, give her talk, but she's not able to today. But she has uh, two of her colleagues are going to join us, Karen and Kirsty Brown. Um, uh, Karen works for the medical information team and Kirsty's working with the what I imagine is the very busy corona uh, virus response team at the moment. Um, one of the reasons why uh, I invited them to come and do this talk is I listened to that incredible podcast that um, Sarah did with Michael Rosen, all about language around the NHS. I mean, it doesn't get any more important than that, does it? Um, so they are going to give us a talk, uh, talking about how they introduced standards and uh, the guidance that they work to. And there are some examples of their work as well. So over to you, ladies. Thank you. Thanks so much, Helen. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Kirsty Brown. I am not Sarah Wilcox, unfortunately, our resident queen of the NHS Digital Service Manual. She's unfortunately not able to make it today, but I'm going to do my best to fill her boots. I have uh, worked with the Digital Service Manual. Uh, there's a quite a large group of us that input into the work that happens on that uh, project. So I'm hoping I can give you a flavour of it, if not the intimate detail that Sarah uh, could give you. And Karen? Yes, um, I work on the medicines inf information pages on the NHS website and I, I've been with NHS.UK for about four years. I've also worked on um, campaigns for Public Health England. Lovely. So, yeah, as Helen said, we're going to talk a bit today about the um, the well, in fact, I'm going to talk a bit about the digital service manual and how we are trying to use it to create a culture of care and what that means for us as NHS content designers. But also I'm going to talk a little bit about how we um, are trying to use it to uh, influence various different things, such as supporting users with low health literacy. I'm going to talk a little bit about inclusive language, and um, that's going to touch on some of the, the old classics like the pee and poo. But it's quite interesting listening to all these other talks. I think we're going to touch on quite a few things that have been mentioned in here. And then Karin, uh, Karin's going to move on, and Karin's going to talk about um, the great work that the medicines team have been doing about supporting people managing their own depression and um, uh, a little bit about some of the work we've done on the um, conditions A to Z, where we talk about Down syndrome and how we've really updated the content there. So I'll start at the very beginning. So this is um, a couple of slides from the fairly newly created NHS service standard. So the service standard is part of the digital service manual and that guides um, all our digital teams, including content designers, in um, sort of how to create digital content in, in the 
the sort of context of what we're doing it's as you might be able to tell from looking at it it's very much based on the gov.uk service standard so this there's 14 points in the gov.uk service standard and we have all of them written sometimes slightly differently for the context of health and then we also have an additional three points that are specific to uh, the nhs service standard so this point number 15 this is the first of the additional ones um, and it's around creating and uh, supporting a culture of care, which is really essential um, in what it means to build good services for the NHS. Um, the second paragraph in here actually is particularly important for us content designers because it's all about making users feel valued and supported and involving them and helping them manage their own care where that's appropriate. Um, if we were to click on this link, we then get onto a little bit more information. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so this is a bit more information on why this is so important. And hilariously, this definitely needs some content design work. As you can yeah. see, the, the, uh, yeah, the first line is digital services are not excluded from the NHS commitment to care and compassion, which basically means digital services should also uh, be have a commitment to compare and compassion in the same way that all other NHS services do. Um, and it goes on to talk a bit about how we can improve people's experience of care by being inclusive and treating them with respect. Um, in this, this is sort of the context that we all try to work in as content designers. And we're going to talk about a couple of specific examples of things we do to try and make our content more inclusive and respectful. So I'm going to start by just giving an overview of uh, of the of the digital service manual and some part which is kind of uh, some of the parts that are specific to this for content design. Uh, so the content style guide is is um, the main. Uh, resource that we have which helps us as content designers across the whole of NHS Digital and the wider services um, create content that is based on what we what we want to be putting out there. So there's some the, some of the things you'd really expect from any kind of style guide. So there's sort of how we write, tone of voice, formatting, punctuation and I promise I'm not going to go through it all but um, the three kind of key things I'm going to focus on today are the section on health literacy, the section on inclusive language and the section on the A to Z of health writing. So what is health literacy? Um, health literacy uh, is it's um, the concept of people being able to use the information, being able to use information and under, like understand it and use it to manage their health. So it's not just about reading it and understanding the words, it's being able to take that away and create actionable movement from it to help them manage their own health. And it's a, a really big problem. So the British Journal of General Practice in 2015 did a study of health information materials. It, it looked at a lot of things, including um, topics on healthy weight, food and medicine labels, letters, test results. And what it found was that 40 percent of people struggle when understanding health information. And this number increases to 60% as soon as numbers are involved. So numbers are particularly problematic to this, but typical health information is a really difficult thing for people to understand. And it's a really serious problem as well as being a really big problem. So it's linked to lots of negative health outcomes. Um, come some of the really key and most pernicious ones being access to screening and vaccination, difficulty taking your medicines correctly, and I mean, crucially, reduced life expectancy. So if you can't understand and utilize the information you're being given, that can have a really, really serious negative effect on your life. So by taking content and writing it in a way that helps people with low health literacy, we can not only help them live longer, but we can also help them live healthier. So that's the idea behind a lot of it. We have guidance on health literacy within our content style guide, which kind of goes into a bit more of the history and some of the research into it. Um, and this is accessible to anyone to look at. 
Uh, and then from that, we also have a set of uh, recommendations. So these are to use reusability tools to help prioritize content, to follow the service design principles and to follow the content style guide. And then key to all of this is to test with users that have low health literacy. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this first one, um, which is an interesting one. So we recommend the, the sort of key point to bring out here is we recommend to use uh, readability tools. And in this case, we're talking about smog tools, but we only recommend them to prioritize content. We don't recommend readability tools to tell you how easy your content is to understand. It can show you if language is maybe too complex and it can help you decide which content to focus on and where to start prioritizing. But we don't we don't think that it, it is an all knowing tool and that's why testing is so important. So uh, yeah, we we are definitely wary of uh, of of these kind of um, giving too much power to tools like this. So Smog gives you a readability score or a reading age. Sometimes it's a grade level. It's usually an American one, which is interesting anyway. Um, but it doesn't um, it doesn't tell you everything. So for one thing, you can write complete gibberish, but so long as it is relatively short sentences and and you keep the syllable count down it can give you a pretty decent score so it's not really um, a measure of whether or not a content is good or clear or um, usable but it can be a good measure of how complicated things are another problem with it is um the classic reading age is based on vocabulary and it's it's based on the vocabulary you would expect a child of a given age to know, which is fine, but it isn't really reflective of, of who our audience is. So an adult might have very low, low literacy and might find reading difficult, but their vocabulary will still not be the same as a child who has um, a reading age of nine. They'll have life experience which will have informed their, which will have informed their language that they use and the vocabulary they understand. So it's not fully representative of what the problem was. And Sarah wanted me to point out that she was in fact taken to task uh, after a recent Radio 4 stats program, more or less, where she uh, talked about average reading age because some people basically quite rightly said that it can often be used as a uh, as a as a measure, but it can also be used quite meaninglessly and in, in, it's not really something that should be utilized as a way to measure how well you're doing. Um, there's really good information out there about literacy levels in the UK and the Skills for Life survey found that about one in six adults have really poor literacy skills. So it's not it's not an insignificant number of people. And when you add on to that the complexity of health information, it becomes an even more kind of pressing concern. So I really like difficult and really obvious example of it specifically in the terms of health context is that the word positive in everyday life is a positive word but used in a health setting it becomes quite a different word so this was an example from the program with Michael Rosen the word of mouth um, the surgeon said that the tests were positive and my father breathed a great sigh of relief and said thank goodness and then the surgeon quickly interrupted him and said no I mean that the test showed there were still cancer cells present and that's something we come across a lot there are words that within the context of health have a very different meaning and a readability tool wouldn't pick that up but when you're talking to users they do pick it up so that's why we always want to be using tools to help inform how we prioritize but we don't want to be using them to make sure that what we're doing is working. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, inclusive content and that's a really important area of our work. So within the content style guide we have a whole section on inclusive language. Um, this is we talk about age and disability and other sort of sensitive issues around inclusivity and it has been by far and away some of the hardest content to put together and it also changes the most of any content in the content style guide. The language around sex, gender and sexuality is particularly um, challenging. It takes uh, a lot of time and the, it's an area where a lot of people have very strong opinions but also those opinions don't always agree with each other. So in order to try and mitigate some of that, what we have done when approaching this um, is try and involve 
as many communities and as many voices as we possibly can when we're creating this content. Um, we update that guidance regularly and we check in with all of those groups whenever we do. It's been updated, I think, three or four times in the last year at least, and each time it's gone out to a wide consulting group and we've considered all the feedback to try and put it together. Um, it's a really specific area of the site where we want to make sure that we're writing for people in their own voice rather than trying to put a standard on it as to what we feel it should be. So if we take a look at the sex and body parts section in particular, um, this is just a small bit of that content. So only mention sex, gender or sexuality if they're relevant, for example, to signpost people and help them get the information and access to treatment they need. We also talk about how it's better to talk about the body parts themselves than talk about a person's sex or gender when you're referring to it. This is um, really important and sometimes in ways that aren't necessarily obvious when you start looking into something. Um, a really good example of this is screening. So in particular, cervical screening, um, which is a, a, a test for people with cervixes. But if you're talking about it in terms of a test for women, there are a group of people, trans, trans men, not gender non-binary, non-conforming. There's a group of people who aren't going to identify with the terminology you're using and they may not feel connected to that service. They may not feel it's relevant to them because they might not make the connection that just because they don't identify as a woman, they still have a cervix. And it's, it's um, particularly relevant because if you're a trans man and you're registered as a man with your GP surgery, you're not going to get invited automatically. Like, people who are registered as women with their GP surgery will. So the onus on getting screening moves to you. So if you're not identifying with the way that the content is written about you, you're going to miss out on something that could potentially prevent you getting cancer. And that's just such a, an important thing. And if we just flip it around and we talk about the body part rather than the gender or sex associated with it, that stops that being a problem. So it's a really important area of the site. So we don't mind updating it 400 times a year. It's fine. If, if we're getting it right, then that's the, that's the main thing. So next, I'm going to just finish up my bit a little bit talking about um, the A to Z of health writing that we have in the content style guide. So this reflects quite a lot of things we've learned from users, from user testing, um, and it is trying to focus on how we make the content about health as easy to understand as possible. And the, the two entries that we talk about a lot are uh, P and Poo, and they're very good examples because they demonstrate the continued challenges that we can face by trying to be as inclusive and accessible in the approach that we take. So uh, this is the entry for P, and uh, I believe at this point Sarah's written a blog about it. She's been on two different radio shows about it. She has been in The Guardian about it. It's a very proud moment. Um, so there's been a lot written about this. Um, and we, we do get complaints about it. Uh, we get a lot of complaints about it. We get told that, it's dumbing down, we should be trying to educate the public, we're being too simplistic, it's patronising, they're gross words, they're childish. We get a lot of complaints and so we wanted to understand how widespread these views are, you know, are we are we starting to limit people by using this language? So we looked at over 10,000 replies to a website survey and by and large most of them were positive, nine out of ten people were felt the language we used was appropriate and was pitched to the right level but um the the it sort of they felt that it, it 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 was simple but not too simple but we also know that a lot of the people that fill in our surveys tend to have very good levels of literacy it's just a that's a bias that exists so we wanted to test this a bit further and we particularly wanted to test it with people who don't find reading easy. So we tested a group of words um, that we get the most complaints about. And uh, we tested them with various different people with different health literacy levels. And we tested them over an, a number of other user research sessions that we were doing that were not about that topic. So it was, it was an additional piece of user testing that we did for it. And the results were very clear. I mean, everybody understood pee and urine. Everybody understood poo. People, no one ever used stool. No one ever used bowel, bowel movements. And um, people, particularly with a learning disability or with dyslexia, were 
slightly more likely to use the simpler words like poo and pee. Uh, we did consider using we, but that has other accessibility problems. So voice technologies often confuse it with other similar sounding words like we meaning us or we meaning small, if you're of a Scottish persuasion. Um, and so now we use pee, urine and poo because everybody understands them, including people that find reading difficult. And key is that uh, the key is that sometimes we do still understand that that GPs might use words or that people might see um, a word on a screening letter or an information letter or a results letter. So when that is the case, we do sometimes still use those terms, but we always explain them. So we would say a sample of poo, stool sample, so that we're always making sure that the simpler term is always used. And Yes, there are people that don't like these words, but the kind of material point is that we've never seen anyone, no matter how much they might dislike the word that we use, not being able to understand it. And that's really what the, the kind of boil down point is, is that we, we understand that you might not like it, but there is a reason for us doing it. And the reason is that you, you understood it, even if you didn't like it. So at that point, um, it also means that if somebody reads blood in their poo, and they understand it, that might save their life. So that's kind of why we use the words we use. And I'm gonna hand over to Karen now, who's gonna talk about some of the other ways that we support and value our users. Yeah, thanks, Kirsty. Um, so I'd now just like to take you through some of my team's work on the medicines A to Z, um, where we're working towards listing 300 of the most commonly used medicines. Um, basically, we're, we're trying to make those awful patient leaflets that come with your medicine package to sort of turn that into plain English. And we've also were able to give extra advice around like coping with side effects and then maybe letting people know how quickly their medicines or treatment is likely to work. So in terms of mental health and antidepressants, um, our antidepressant pages do get a lot of traffic. So we've got for sertraline here, 70,000 um, visits a month. And antidepressants can be used for, can be prescribed for low mood, anxiety, panic attacks, PTSD, as well as depression. And when we came to test these pages with, with patients taking these medications, we've actually found that this user group really needs to see their specific condition featured really prominently on the page. If these users didn't find what they were looking for right away, we saw them going back to Google to search again. And we also could observe actually how stressful the whole process was for some of them, particularly the patients um, with anxiety. So as content designers, we need to try and find a solution. Um, each page has an overview or about section. And we just found this really has to be to the point. So it's simple things like reducing the word count, but also adding in links and sometimes um, bulleted lists, which actually help to give these keywords better stand out. And we found that users were able to scan the page more quickly and orientate themselves and realise they had come to the right topic. Still on antidepressants, these have been in the news this month. This is a story from the BBC website from earlier 4th of August. Um, some antidepressants like amitriptyline, for example, are used for treating depression, but also for pain relief. And so when we previously come to test our amitriptyline content, we actually saw that users found it really confusing to have everything on one page people with chronic pain, they really need different information to the people that were managing their mental health condition. I mean, for example, doses for pain relief are much lower. Um, equally, we saw that people with the chronic pain, by seeing details about mental health conditions on what they saw as their page, it actually made them sometimes uneasy. It, you could almost sense that they were thinking, doesn't my doctor think my pain is real? Is it all in my mind? Why have I been given an antidepressant? So one way to deal with this was to introduce standalone pages. So we've got here amitriptyline for depression and one for pain and migraine. And just by careful labelling, using the H1 and H2 tags, um, it just helped people, again, orientate quickly and then we made sure that we signposted to the parallel topic at the end um, of the about section on each one, just so people could find what they wanted quickly. Um, 
And in fact, this two pronged approach proved helpful when we came to review our pregnancy information on medicines. Um, we were saying that antidepressants weren't generally recommended during pregnancy. And yes, this is factually correct and in, in, in line with the prescribing guidance. But we were actually getting feedback from midwives and GPs who were saying, you know, this isn't, in fact, the real life experience of many people. Um, if someone needs uh, antidepressants to manage an ongoing health issue, they actually probably need to keep taking these during pregnancy. Um, so we need to review our information, strike a balance to actually help these women or these pregnant people feel supported in managing their mental health. You know, otherwise there was a genuine risk that reading our page could panic someone and stop them from taking their medicine. Um, and so these are basically the key takeaways that we got from our research. Um, keep taking your medicine. Of course, discuss the options with your doctor. And yes, your GP probably can prescribe your antidepressants for you if you need them. And the nice thing was we didn't really need to dramatically change the information on our pages. It was more about how we presented it, the positioning of the messages and also softening the language. Um, and I've just got a page here quickly showing this. This was like the more detailed approach that we were able to give to people. And interestingly, going back to the amitriptyline and the two separate pages, we only need to um, update the advice on the antidepressants page. The one for chronic pain could stay the same. Um, now, I don't know if we're running out of time because I've got a few quick slides on Down syndrome. I we think we're going to have to end it there. I'm sorry. I'm really no, that's sorry. fair enough. We are, we are um, supposed to finish at uh, 5.30, but... Don't worry, I'll just get the was... final one. Oh, go, yep. Well, it's not with <laughs> contact details there, but it should be Kirsty as well, but... Yeah, that was excellent. Thank you so very much. Um, and I, I love the, the sort of the detail and the depth that you have to go to to figure out that you should say P and not we, because some people think we mean small. That's superb. Um, we do have a question here, and it's, it's an excellent one. Um, Amy Hoops asks, uh, has there been any attempt made to align the language that you're using here in digital formats and print with actual GPs and healthcare professionals in their in their world and, and their work? So if we're, we're suggesting that you should say pee, poo, and, and make things really, really clear for people, can they do the same in their day job? Well, that's a really good question. Um, we are trying to reach out more and engage with healthcare professionals. And we know that we know that some GPs and some pharmacists, for example, do use the website um, and refer their patients to them. And we've had feedback, I think Kirsty will hopefully agree, we've had feedback that it has really helped them just to start to think about communicating with their patients in language that just normal people use. Mm. So I think we have got doctors saying pee and poo, um, but equally we do try to reflect, as Kirsty said on one of her slides, if someone is gonna hear something in a healthcare setting, we try to explain that terminology as well, just, just to empower people to understand about their health. Yeah. yeah. I think it's definitely difficult. I think that um, a lot, you know, because the the NHS is set up the way it is there are a lot of services that we all wish were more joined up and there was a way for us to be more um, uh, comprehensive and, and push these things out more but I think we are making inroads as as Karen says and it will just take I think it's going to take a while and there's going to be some people who are very resistant to it but I do think that there are a lot more people now who are yeah, referencing and coming back to the website when they need uh, to look at how to explain things more simply. But there's also a lot we still need to do as well. Like there's a lot that we still need to do. So, yeah, it's a two way street. <laughs> Keep doing it. That was uh, absolutely superb. Thank you all so much. I think we're at the end of our content tea time now. So pleased uh, that you all were able to join us and our speakers were excellent. Thank you so much. I'd also like to say thank you to Joe Schofield. My, uh, together, we were so worried about the technology just before we did this. We had a little run through, but it's gone so well. Joe, thank you very much for organizing this with us and everyone, uh, thanks for, for listening. Joe, do you want to say anything? No, just thank you very much. Yeah, it's been amazing to work on it. And I'm so, so many sleepless nights about sharing screens using Microsoft, but we did it. So thank you for our last meeting. <laughs> we did it. We loved it. Thank you all very much. Keep fighting the good fight. Keep writing the good words. Thanks for having us.
You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.